So following uh, the elegant presentations of Mario and, uh, and uh, Rafik, we actually obviously work from the other end, uh, which is basically transcription of HIV. And so I'll try to go slowly through some of the data and uh, some of the problems that are to eradicate HIV from our viewpoint. But primarily the strategy obviously is that you have defined the latent reservoir and residual replication of HIV, and we are in the class that both of them occur at the same time. Uh, residual replication mostly in lymphoid organs and true latency mostly seen in the periphery because those cells are the most quiescent, the cells that, uh, that actually uh, circulate. And then the strategy to eliminate this reservoir is either to render cells uninfectable, so Rafik actually mentioned this already, and that's the paradigm of this approach is the Berlin patient, and it's very promising what the Sangamo team and uh, Rafik have done in terms of uh, making dual immune systems with the Delta CCR5 uh, receptor. Uh, the other approach is to shock and kill, to wake up all virally infected cells and let either the immune system drugs or the virus itself eliminate uh, all infectable cells. Uh, and then there are strategies to prevent the establishment of uh, latency. Primarily the paradigm here is the neonate from Mississippi. And we believe that the reason that they are easily cured is because they have no memory T cells. So they basically do not establish a reservoir. And so if you start very early with an Im immature immune system, you're able to prevent the latent reservoir establishment, and therefore you can cure uh, individuals. Now that's more unlikely in adults than in neonates, obviously. And there's hope for a partial cure, and Mario alluded to this in the two people who got transplanted in Boston, that they had prolonged periods of viral free uh, 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 before the rebound after drug interruption, uh, but the 14 patients presented from France that had very intensified early heart also showed some functional cure, in other words, longer periods of time where they did not require antiretroviral therapy. So we believe that one of the best ways to look for complete latency is the ratios of short to long transcripts, and I'll go into that in a moment because I think it's good to renew this particular hypothesis that you make short transcripts only in true latency and you make longer transcripts when you have residual replication. This can be achieved by doing RT-QPCR approaches in, uh, in cells. You can do RNA fluorescent inside the hybridization, which is a little bit more difficult. I think Ashley Haas is uh, trying to do this. And the most recent experiment that we are doing now is with TAR exosomes. In other words, exosomes from infected cells that contain nothing but TAR RNA. Uh, which are sort of a marker for true latency in the, in the, in the tissues. And Kashanchi showed they're quite abundant. I'll show that some of this data, and we are actually able to confirm that, in fact, in optimally treated individuals, there are TAR exosomes floating in the bloodstream. For residual replication, again, it's immunofluorescence of PBMCs and tissues. And then for our analysis, we use NEF exosomes, microvesicles, so cells that replicate HIV in tissues actually excrete NEF exosomes. This NEF exosomes circulate in the circulation. They actually even exit the CSF and go into the periphery. And actually, we're trying to do a ratio of NEF exosomes to TAR exosomes to actually determine the reservoir of residual replication versus true latency in infected individuals. And one of the cases we're trying to do this on is, in fact, the Berlin patient to see if there's any evidence of virus anywhere in, in the body. <laughs> now, I'll just return to slides which are 30 years old because this just amplifies the point that in the absence of the TAT transactivator, and it's not important, you only get short transcripts from the HIV LTR. These are probes that go from, from the LTR to the transcribed region to the coding region. And you can see that there's no upstream transcription. There's very nice initiation of transcription, but no elongation in the absence of TAT. And this is true transcriptional latency because no viral RNA except for TAR is made and no viral proteins are made because there are no long transcripts. So this is 
uh, an RT-PCR analysis of latency. Uh, and unfortunately, it was published uh, um, 20 years ago. And so Mario probably hasn't uh, read the paper, but uh, you were not born. But basically what we do is we use primers that amplify only short transcripts and primers that amplify long transcripts. And this is, this is before heart. And every single zero conversion, every single person who zero converted, at the periphery, at the initial stage of the infection, no long transcript. So this is before protease inhibitor. This is just basically AZT, 3TC, and some of the uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors. So that means what you see in the circulation at zero conversion without any real intervention, drug intervention, is latency. Short transcripts, no long transcripts. In 10 out of 10 patients, we were able to activate the virus to full level of replication. Totally infectious virus, but it took a while and it had to be extremely strong activation signal. This was allogeneic cells, mixed lymphocyte reaction, and in every single patient, in every single individual that was like no viral transcription except for short transcripts, we were able to get full reconstitution of live virus. So if there's any proof for latency, transcriptional latency, this must be it. And it's three years before the paper that Mario quoted to define latency. 1994 in PNAS. This is the paper. And basically, we were able to demonstrate in the same manuscript that if you have no lymph nodes where active replication is going on, activated T cells go into the periphery, and now you see short and long transcripts in circulating. And you can almost time the transition between basically asymptomatic phase, ARC, and full AIDS by just looking at short and long transcripts in the periphery. And the reason that there is no long transcript in the periphery is because these are the most resting lymphocytes. The moment you activate partially lymphocyte, it homes somewhere, it sticks somewhere, it goes somewhere. So these are truly resting lymphocytes because the moment you activate them, they home, they stick. And so residual replication occurs in lymph node tissues, occurs in areas of inflammation, but it does not occur in the periphery as long as the lymphoid system is intact. And in fact, later on, we showed, uh, this is now 10 years later, we showed that in these individuals, you need a hell of a lot to activate the virus from this pool. So some of them takes two weeks before we have an outgrowth assay working. Some we never achieve it. So in other words, here there's five. We never achieve an outgrowth assay, even with strong activation. And you can see here, if you wait, this is basically day seven, you see almost nothing. Day 11, you see a little bit. And so basically, it's really difficult to reactivate the virus, except eventually you always achieve it. But you may have to wait two weeks. You may have to wait three weeks. And so for a very active uh, activation, sort of the shock and kill type of approach. Now, what I just told you is in this particular slide. So what is going on here? And HIV has defined it. This is RNA polymerase. Why is it stopping? Hmm. Too soon. OK. This is RNA polymerase coming to the HIV LTR. It will stop there. It will do nothing for a long, long time. In other words, in every patient we ever looked at, every cell we ever looked at, there's RNA polymerase on the HIV LTR already. But it doesn't elongate very well. And the reason it doesn't elongate very well is because of the kinases I will talk to you about in a moment. But eventually, if you get those kinases to the polymerase, you will start to elongate along the viral genome. And she will elongate, believe it or not. She will also terminate. Uh, polymerase. So see, she's waiting for the appropriate signal, and this is latency to some extent. Now she is elongating on the genome. This is the viral genome, and it stopped again. She actually goes pretty fast. It's about four kilobases per minute uh, that you get in terms of transcription elongation rate. And now she will terminate, cleave, polyadenylate, and allow the RNA to be released for infection of other cells. So if you got that slide, you got my lecture. 
So polymerase is stalled, arrested on the HIV LTR. It could be three prime or five prime end, five prime end or three prime, depending on transcription interference. But you've got to get the polymerase going before you see the virus. And that is one of the major problems of latent reservoir, that the polymerase just does not go. And that is also true for transcription interference, which we think is the biggest problem in terms of latency, where you have a gene X going through the integrated provirus in the intron. Now, Warner Green and Silicano got it wrong because they said the polymerase just keeps going. No, the polymerase stops in the poly A site right here. It's a very good poly A site. It's the poly A site that's used for gene trap technology to inactivate genes. And then basically the three prime LTR behaves like the five prime LTR and you get short transcripts from the three prime LTR. So the short transcripts mark both transcription interference if it's in the sense direction because it comes from the three prime LTR or from five prime LTR if the transcription factors are not sufficient to allow for expression of the viral genome. Now the problem here is in the anti-sense orientation. So here you have gene Y and Silicano and w Green again show that there was actually a collision going on. There is no collision. Basically, the, this gene always wins out because the moment that HIV integrates into the intron or host genome, this polymerase is already gone through and removed all the transcription factors which would otherwise allow HIV uh, to uh, initiate transcription. And we still believe that this is one of the major problems of HIV biology because when we silenced a gene X in an experimental system, because it was estrogen responsive, the viral genome immediately started to transcribe and the virus, fully competent virus, emerged from the cell that was before transcription interfered. So the moment you silence the gene, which is interfered with HIV transcription, you get HIV to come out and to replicate and infect other cells. Now, how about the reservoir? The reservoir, even with Silicano's latest paper in cell, is bigger uh, than, than, uh, than what he suggests because when Paul Lucio, Tom North, and I looked at the lymphoid organs in the rhesus macaque, there was about a hundredfold more cells that were able to replicate HIV by DNA and RNA than in the periphery. So basically, the reservoir could be as high as 10 to the 9 cells in infected individuals on heart. And the biggest reservoir in our study was in the gut lymphoid tissues uh, and other lymphoid spleen and peripheral lymph node organ in the body. So this is extrapolating from the rhesus macaques infected by an RT shift. Now, as I told you before, the way we're looking at the reservoir is through NEF exosomes, which imply active replication. And uh, they are very abundant, for example, in CNS, even in optimally treated individuals. Uh, and NEF is very toxic to neurons and uh, astrocytes, and so basically this could be partly the reason for the hand or HIV-associated uh, neurodegeneration. Uh, and this, even the CNS uh, exosomes actually go into the circulation and you can detect them in the periphery. Uh, not just we have observed this NEF exosome, but Andreas Bauer has published in individuals optimally with heart, there's NEF exosomes in the periphery. Now the origin of this is unclear. And Kashanchi has now published on TAR exosomes. And surprisingly enough, their levels are even higher in long-term non-progressors, which means that perhaps the immune system is keeping the virus in a latent state or increasing the latent reservoir uh, because it does not allow for the replication of the virus through the high CTL activity. But anyway, the TAR exosomes seem to be a very good measure of the latent reservoir in the individuals. So this is Andreas Bauer's lab, and this is Kashanchi. And before you saw that we published in traffic that also HIV NEF is secreted in exosomes and triggers apoptosis in bystander non-activated CD4 T cells. So basically, NEF could be impartially responsible for immune activation that is observed in HIV disease. And these NEF exosomes enter uh, cells, especially resting CD4 positive T cells and they cause apoptosis through activation-induced mechanisms. So it's an activation-induced apoptosis, which leads to uh, death of the bystander cells. So as uh, Rafik has already alluded to, there is now a major uh, effort in the United States to, uh, to cure HIV. These are called the Delaney uh, 
Collaboratoria. Uh, there is one based in Seattle that is doing the CCR5 uh, uh, modification of the immune system, uh, or collaborating with Sangabo and obviously Rafik. Uh, then there is the one uh, that's headed by David Margolis, which is primarily dedicated to shock and kill therapy to wake up latent proviruses. And then there's the DARE Collaboratorium that uh, Rafik, uh, Steve Dix, and Mike McCune uh, head that basically is looking at immune mechanisms of eradication. Now, I will just skip the slides of the Timothy Brown Berlin patient because it has been alluded to before. The only thing I would like to tell you that the mechanisms that are being used so far for removing the or making deletions in the CCR5 gene are this either zinc finger nucleases or this talent nucleases, which are all protein based. And there is now a new technology, which I think is even more promising that we're using, and I guess other people are using extensively for inactivation of genes, for insertion of genetic material into genes, which is an RNA based uh, technology using the CRISPR RNA, which binds something called Cas9 and the nuclease. And you can actually cut very easily double strand DNA because the Cas9 will actually make a bubble in the DNA. It will actually unwind the DNA. We actually think this is also very, very useful for transcription interference because it will stall the polymerase from the upstream gene. And we're using this kind of experiments to try to see if we can wake up latent proviruses with a gene therapeutic approach using the CRISPR Cas9 system. And perhaps in the next year or so, I'll be able to report on, uh, on this particular uh, initiative. Now, the other possibility, obviously, would be to increase the expression of any of these restriction factors. And we already heard today that maybe the HLA B57 B, uh, uh, has a higher expression of Stauffen, uh, Schlafen, sorry, Schlafen 11 restriction element to HIV. And so we think that there will be other possibilities that if you can increase or modify the restriction factors, you will actually slow down HIV replication. But those are still in the pipeline in terms of uh, how to approach this particular uh, problem. So I would just like to get a little bit into shock and kill strategy. We think that basically there are two main uh, considerations here. There is the NF kappa B, which needs to be uh, released from uh, the cytoplasmic pool. And there has to be an effic a suffi efficient supply or a, a sufficient supply of theta B to be able to elongate HIV uh, transcription. So basically, you need to have two hits. You need to have NF kappa B, and you need to have theta B. And actually, you need to also have a CDK11 kinase that I will just allude to a little bit uh, during the rest of the talk. So the NF kappa B is primarily released by PKC agonist, which are basically prostratin, bryostratin, ingenol, and perhaps others. So these are bryologs also. Uh, there are some prostratin derivatives. And these agents actually uh, release nf kappa B from the inhibitory complex from the cytoplasm, and that sits on the HIV LTR and initiates HIV transcription. Now, PTA B uh, is the kinase that uh, is the coactivator of TAT and absolutely required for HIV transcription. HIV is the most sensitive uh, transcription unit that's sensitive to, this, to levels of PTA B. Resting cells have none. Dividing cells partition between active and inactive complexes. And PKC agonists, in addition to releasing nf B from the inactive complex, will also increase levels of PTA B. So PKC agonists have dual function, activating nf B and increasing the synthesis of PTA B. But then all the other drugs that you can talk about, HDAC inhibitors, HMBA, bed bromodomain inhibitors, 5 cytonine will release PTA B from the inactive complex and allow for its recruitment to the HIV LTR. And that is why you need two drugs to reactivate HIV. One for this and one for this. So I will just skip this because uh, the cells are not so rare anymore, the latent cells or the residual replicating cells. And obviously new approaches are needed to uh, so I'd just like to review a little bit the HIV LTR. It's a bit complex, but this is Peter B. So Peter B is cyclin T1, CDK9. This is a kinase that phosphorylates the polymerase, RNA polymerase, so it can elongate. And CDK9 is recruited by TAT, is recruited by NF-kappa B, 
and it's recruited by the superlongation complex uh, to the HIV LTR. Uh, and it's absolutely essential for HIV transcription. And what is important here is that basically PTAB also modifies all these factors that stall the polymerase so that the polymerase is able to elongate. So there's a negative elongation factor and a DRB sensitivity inducing factor which need to be modified before the polymerase can enter into the coding region and copy the viral genome. Now it turns out that the way you activate PK, uh, uh, Peter B is by stress, okay? And what is stress? Stress is apoptosis, stress is UV light, stress is DNA damage, stress is actinomycin D, stress is DRB flavor period or kinase inhibitors, Cla stress is HDAC inhibitors, stress is HMBA, hexamethyl and bisacetamide, stress is bad bromodomain inhibitors, so stress is anything that causes some perturbation in the structure of the cell or the structure of the chromatin itself. And that releases p b from this inactive complex where most of it resides in all cells, where hexim inhibits the activity of CDK9. And then this released p b is now able to get to the HIV LTR to allow for HIV transcription. Uh, so. The, the beauty of the system, and perhaps the only thing that's unique to, of HIV to the system, is that once you have released Peter B from this inactive complex, it will actually reassemble this inactive complex very rapidly because the cell doesn't like too much free Peter B. But TAT is the only protein that we've known so far that can compete with hexin for the binding of Peter B. So once you have allowed TAT to be made, TAT will actually take PTB from this inactive complex and allow for HIV transcription to continue. And I think this is a very important idea for shock and kill strategy because the only thing you have to do is to release enough PTB to make TAT and then TAT will allow for HIV transcription to continue even if the cell becomes resting. In other words, even the cell reverts to an inactive state, HIV transcription will continue because TAT and hexim compete for CDK9 cyclin T1 and allow for HIV transcription to continue even in the setting of the reassembly of this inactive complex, which inevitably has to occur for the cell to survive. Now, just to diagram this, so the stress releases all the PTB, so all the PTB becomes active very quickly. For example, HDEC inhibitors do this in uh, 32 minutes to an hour. And then as you release the PTB, hexim synthesis goes sky high, and eventually it becomes larger than it was at the beginning. So basically at the end of this, PTB is totally inhibited. And that is the basis for HDEC inhibitors and bad bromodomain inhibitors to inactivate cells, to kill the cancer cell. That is the mechanism of how this compound cause cancer, cancer cells to undergo apoptosis is by increasing the synthesis of hexim, which inactivates PTB and the cells do not survive. But in this window, which is one to six hours, HIV transcription begins, TAT is being made and TAT continues even though the free supply of free PTB to other genes is inhibited. And this is how Saha works. This is how bad bromodomain inhibitors work. This is how HMBA works. And this is basically how all the stresses that people can put onto cells work uh, by releasing PTB and then increasing the synthesis of hexim. So the only thing you do if you're a cancer physician is to follow levels of hexim to see if you can use these drugs for the therapy of your cancer of choice, such as leukemia, lymphoma, breast cancer, melanomas, and so forth. If you can determine that hexim synthesis has gone up, then the drugs will be therapeutic in those particular tumors and they will be therapeutic for HIV reactivation. So, what is the stress? So, one of the molecules that causes stress is the bad bromodomain inhibitors. For example, JQ1, IBET, the hottest drug right now in, in the pharmaceutical industry, especially against multiple myeloma and some leukemias. And they, in, they basically uh, interact with all of these BRD proteins, BRD1 to BRD8. And basically what they do is they change the structure of chromatin. So this is a nucleus of a resting, or at least a normal nucleus of a cell. This is a lymphocyte. And when you give it 
JQ1, for example, you can see that all the chromatin has condensed, so compacted. And this compaction is a major stress to the cell, leading to the release of Peter B and the hexim synthesis. And you can monitor this by looking at uh, the decrease of the large complex. This is the, uh, this is a sucrose gradient looking at the large complex or the release of Peter B from the inactive complex. So this is the increase. Or you can look at the RNA binding of hexim, which has been released from the large complex. But after five years of intense work, we have now a very sensitive assay to follow Peter B in infected cells and any cell. And that is by bimolecular fluorescent measurement where we have one fluorophore on Peter B, one fluorophore on RNA polymerase II, and when Peter B gets to RNA polymerase II to activate transcription, the cells will turn green. And so this is, for example, I don't know if you can see it very well, but this is BIFC of Peter B release and RNA polymerase II phosphorylation following, in this case, JQ1. And you can see that within 50 minutes, you start seeing green cells. By 75 uh, minutes, they are quite green. And 90 minutes, they are uh, totally green. Uh, and if you do that assay, you will see that UV light will activate green cells, actinomycin D, DRB, flavopyridol, all the kinase inhibitors will turn green because the cell tries to survive. HMBA, HDAC, and bad bromodomain inhibitors, PKC agonists, PMA, prostrate, and brastrate in general. Leflunomide, which is now very hot in terms of treatment of melanoma, will do this and increase the synthesis of hexim. And to our surprise, 5 azacytidine will do the same. So in other words, maybe 5 azacytidine does not work primarily through the DNA demethylation, but again through an increased synthesis of hexim following the release of Peter B. And that is why azacytidine has an effect before cell cycle uh, division is happening. So the other assay I don't have to go into, but we've developed another assay for screening of this compound that will reactivate HIV, which is a hexim luciferase assay. As I told you before, one of the first things that's activated following free Peter B release is the hexim transcription. And we've been able to show that if you have just a minimal amount of hexim promoter onto luciferase, we can see a fantastic increase in uh, luciferase activity, which basically means that you've been able to free Peter B from the inactive uh, complex. So there are now two screening tests for drugs that will reactivate HIV uh, transcription from latency and from latently infected cells. So, <clears throat> so Peter B is absolutely required. This is cyclin T1, CDK9 for the first step of HIV transcription. We now know that cyclin K, CDK12 is required for alternative splicing of 46 different transcripts. And we know that cyclin L, CDK11 is required for splicing, uh, for three prime end formation of HIV. And we know that both of this compound, both of this, both Peter B and cyclin L, CDK11 are extremely low in uh, resting cells, in uh, cells that have uh, HIV uh, latently integrated uh, in the genome. So if you, we have a model for this, for this uh, particular latency by using peripheral blood uh, CD4 positive cells that we activate through IL-2 and uh, uh, CD3, CD28. This ex expands the cell, then we remove from them IL-2 and all this activation signal, we rest them for two weeks, and you can see that the nnf kappa B levels, Peter B levels, CD cyclin L, CDK11 levels go away in these cells. We then give these cells either HDAC or bet bromodomain inhibitors. They do absolutely nothing because there's no Peter B, there's no cyclin L, CDK11. But if we give them PKC activators, for example, bryostatin, prostatin, uh, ingenol, we start making both NF kappa B, Peter B, and cyclin L, CDK11. And now these HDAC inhibitors, bet bromodomain inhibitors, start working because now they have substrate upon which they can act and we can now reactivate HIV. So basically, the reason for two-drug strategy for shock and kill is that you need drugs that will increase levels of essential transcription factors for HIV transcription. And when you have raised those transcription factors, then these drugs, HDAC inhibitors, and bad bromodomain inhibitors can work and reactivate HIV uh, transcription. And just to show you, 
the cells, the resting cells have no cyclin T1, very little CDK9, no CDK11 basically, and when you give them PHA, PMA, or ionomycin, and uh, in other experiments, prostratin inginol, for example, they start making CDK11, and they start making PKB, and so basically they make the ingredients that require for HIV transcription, and therefore viral replication. So just to mention briefly, inginol, because I'm sure that Lucio and uh, Renato will talk about inginol some more. Uh, it is a PKC agonist. It's, it's used uh, to treat actinic keratosis as a drug called Picato, made by a Danish uh, firm. It is uh, a compound made from this plant, uh, Euphorbia, which is sort of a, a, a common uh, uh, shrub, especially here in Brazil. I think it's called Avalos. Uh, I should let you know that inginol has been used in the Greek, Greek times as a treatment for uh, mostly ascites. It's tr used in uh, China as Kansui, as a very successful drug for treatment of leukemias and lymphomas. And it's actually a very strong inducer of HIV transcription, actually the strongest that we've seen so far. Uh, and we'll hear more about it in the next few days. It can be orally administered uh, and it seems to be very uh, well tolerated. And in our assay, in this uh, primary cell assay, for example, where Saha has absolutely no activity uh, because the cells have no PKB and no uh, CDK11, uh, the treatment with just five nanomolar inginol is very potent at reactivating HIV transcription uh, at 24 and 48 hours after administration. And if you combine it with Saha later on, they have additive effects on HIV uh, transcription. And I think it's very important to start thinking in terms of shock and kill uh, hypothesis that this would be one of the compounds that could be used together with an HDAC inhibitor for the synergistic effects that I've described for reactivation of HIV from latency. So just to summarize uh, my talk, uh, I would like to say that basically most of the uh, HIV uh, is uh, in uh, integrating the host genome, a lot of it in active genes. Uh, you think we, we, we think we'll have to have a combination of a PKC agonist and a Peter B disruptor, whether it be G HMBA, Saha, or JQ1, and the combination of Inginol and Saha, for example, Inginol and JQ1, could well be considered uh, as a treatment for shock and kill therapy in infected individuals on heart. So short promoter proximal transcripts from the HIV alter mark latently infected cells, star exosomes mark this reservoir, NEF exosomes, microvesicles mark residual replication, combination of PKC agonists and PTB releasers reactivate HIV transcription and replication in latently infected cells, HIV anti-latency therapy, Inginol and Saha, Vorinostat, or JQ1 IBET, bet bromodome inhibitors should be considered for this particular approach. Together with optimal HALT, HALT will decrease the reservoir of HIV and might lead to a functional cure. HALT may have to be administered frequently and for long periods of time. And this is the caveat that how well it's going to be tolerated in infected individuals. Finally, I would like to acknowledge the people who did much of the work. Renato Aguiar, who will talk later in the meeting. Luciana Costa, uh, who will also talk later next week, uh, with Tatiana Sampao, did much of the work on NEF. And these are other individuals who actually characterize uh, Peter B. Uh, the other CTD kinase complexes in collaboration with Paul Lucio, David Price, Amilcar, uh, and thank you for your attention. <laughs>